Chapter 1. Would you believe? When Allah wants to frighten his slaves, the sun falls out of its chariot. This is a full eclipse, a misfortune for the sun. An overview might be helpful before we begin. Islam started when Muhammad, a 7th century Arab, purported to be the messenger of God. That much we know for sure. The Quran, he claimed, was a series of revelations he received directly from a nameless lord. The inspirational experience was described by Muhammad to be like a bell clanging in his head, causing him to shake and sweat profusely. These rather nasty experiences continued, he said, until he was able to decipher the message. Thus the Quran, Muslims believe, is God's revelation to man through his final and most important prophet. Yet only Muhammad heard these revelations. He offered no evidence of his divine inspiration. We take the Quran solely on his word. The Bible, by comparison, had 40 authors, all literate, who told a consistent story over the course of 15 centuries. Muhammad, who was admittedly illiterate, acted alone in the formation of Islam and is alleged to have invented his religion over the course of 22 years. Over a billion people live in nations controlled by Islamic principles. Thus, to many, Muhammad was a rousing success. Yet these very same nations are among the world's most destitute, least free, and most violent. And they are the fountain of terror, providing the money, men, motive, and means for murder. In that light, Muhammad's legacy is considerably more tarnished. There were no miracles to prove Muhammad's claim of being a godly conduit. There are no healings, walking on water, parting seas, raising folks from the dead, or feeding multitudes. There are no fulfilled prophecies like the exacting and detailed predictions that biblical prophets routinely made to demonstrate their divine authority. But the most troubling part about our absolute reliance on Muhammad's testimony that his Quran was divinely inspired is that the prophet's character was deficient and his life was despicable as anyone who ever lived. That is not flattering, but it's the only conclusion that can be drawn from the original source material. According to the Quran and Sunnah, Muhammad founded Islam to rule over Arabs, Persians, and Byzantines, and through conquest, to steal their treasures. I will identify and quote thousands of verses from the Islamic scriptures to prove this, but for now, I want you to be an informed skeptic, one with a global view of Muhammad and his creation. This introductory summary will serve as a handrail in what is otherwise a topsy-turvy and disjointed realm. As we move through Muhammad's tortured Genesis accounts and convoluted recastings of biblical patriarchs, you will need this perspective to comprehend his motive and agenda. Over the course of these pages, you'll discover that the prophet's ministry in Mecca was filled with troubling episodes. Following his first Quranic revelation, Muhammad claimed to have been demon-possessed. By his own admission, he tried to commit suicide. Those who knew him best, his family and neighbors, said that he had gone mad. He is demon-possessed, a sorcerer, fabricating scripture, they said, accusing him of plagiarism and having purely selfish motives. They mocked his prophetic claims, ridiculed his Quran, and said that his preposterous notion of turning many idols into one god was insane. As a result of this verbal abuse, all chronicled in the Quran, Muhammad pledged to slaughter his kin. With the Karish bargain, the Meccans proved that Muhammad had established Islam to garner what he craved, power, sex, and money. The satanic verses which followed demonstrated that he was inspired by Halal bin Shakar, known in the West as Lucifer, the biblical Satan. Muhammad's hallucinogenic night's journey to the non-existent temple in Jerusalem confirmed that he could not be trusted. This flight of fancy was followed by the Pledge of Aqaba, where Islam turned political and then declared war on all mankind. Ninety surahs were revealed during this period, 
They open with a score that mirror the style and content of Hanif poetry composed by Zayed, a contemporary of Muhammad. At this point, the Prophet's revealing spirit was an unnamed lord. When we're finally introduced, we learn that the Islamic god's name is Ar-Rahman. He is a dark and demented spirit, one who spends his days in hell. He deceives men, leads them astray, shackles them, dragging them to their doom. Ar-Rahman personally participates in hell's torments, turning men on a spit, tearing them apart, forcing them to eat thorns, pitch, and boiling water. His paradise is a brothel. Its rivers flow with wine, and multiple virgins satiate the carnal desires of the faithful. As you might imagine, Muhammad's contemporaries, the Karish tribe in the little burg of Mecca, thought he was nuts. The Quran contains over 400 iterations of the never-ending argument between Muhammad and his tribe. Those who knew this prophet best called him a charlatan. They charged him with the very offenses the Quran and Hadith confirm he was guilty of perpetrating. Then, demonstrating the maturity and discipline of a schoolyard bully, the Islamic god struck back. He slandered the Meccans with an exhaustive list of hateful slurs and threatened them with a painful doom. When I first read the Quran, I was surprised to find the endless regurgitation of spiteful attacks. The Meccans shouted, Muhammad, you are an insane, demon-possessed sorcerer, forging the Quran. Allah answered, My messenger is not insane, nor is he demon-possessed. I find this perplexing. Why didn't some enterprising scribe edit these incriminating charges out before codifying the Quran? Then I realized that without the raging feud, there was no justification for the scripture's single most repetitive rant. If you reject Muhammad, Muslims will kill you so that his God can roast you alive. I recognize that this is the antithesis of what you expected to see during the formative years of a great religion. Yet the evidence, the only evidence, is irrefutable. The Quran takes us into a demented and violent realm. It is a bad job of plagiarizing held together by a childish rant. Paradise and hell are both decadent and disgusting, more satanic than divine, and the Sunnah, which professes to be inspired scripture, is no better. Stroke by stroke, they present an ugly picture of an abused child who became an abuser. Having destroyed the religion of Islam in Mecca, Muhammad created the political doctrine of submission in Medina. He became a pirate, dictator, and terrorist leader. He used Quranic scripture to justify horrific behavior, pedophilia, incest, rape, torture, assassinations, thievery, mass murder, and terror, all in an unbridled orgy of sex, power, and money. Again, this summation simply reflects the portrayal documented in the Islamic Sunnah and confirmed in the Quran. When he was 50, Muhammad married a six-year-old child. Then he stole his son's wife. After forcing young girls to watch his men execute their fathers, Muhammad raped them. He tortured his victims to make sure no booty escaped his grasp. He committed mass murder, slaughtering Jews in genocidal rage. In ten years, he ordered a score of assassinations and conducted 75 terrorist raids. He used the sword to force Arabs into submission and used the slave trade to finance Islam. He was more interested in collecting girls and taxes than anything else. He ruled through fear, and his God condoned it all. This harsh portrayal, does not represent my interpretation of the most negative Islamic scriptures, or even a view derived from a jaundiced document crafted by an enemy of the religion. It is the only authentic picture. It's the original. By reading the Quran and Hadith, you will see Muhammad embarrass himself and deceive his compatriots, all with his God's blessing. This is the portrait of a prophet and God that was painted by the first Muslims. One does not have to call out the bad from the good to render this verdict. It is really hard to find anything good in their scriptures or behavior. To provide some objectivity to this startling reality, recognize that nothing is known about Muhammad and his creation Islam apart from five books. They represent the only surviving written record scribed within 250 years of the Prophet's life. They, and only they, represent fundamental Islam. They are the authority, the gospel truth. 
Any statement not derived from these sources is conjecture, speculation, and opinion. To firmly establish the validity, nature, and appropriateness of these Islamic scriptures, I want to combine what the Islamic scholars said in the preface of the most revered Hadith collection with what others wrote on the opening page of the Quran. Sahih Bukhari is a collection of sayings and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad, also known as the Sunnah. The reports of the Prophet's sayings and deeds are called Hadith. Bukhari lived a couple of centuries after the Prophet's death and collected his Hadith. Each report in his collection was checked for compatibility with the Quran, and the veracity of the chain of reporters, or Isnad, had to be established. Then, the Quran is one leg of two which forms the basis of Islam. The second leg is the Sunnah of the Prophet. Which makes the Quran different from the Sunnah is its form. Unlike the Sunnah, the Quran is quite literally the word of Allah, whereas the Sunnah, which is comprised exclusively of Hadith, was inspired by Allah, but the wording and the actions are the Prophet's. The Quran has not been expressly using any human words. Its wording is letter for letter fixed by Allah. The Prophet Muhammad was the final messenger of Allah to humanity, and therefore the Quran is the last message which Allah has sent to us. Its predecessors, such as the Torah, Psalms, and Gospels, have all been superseded. The most respected Islamic scholars tell Muslims that the Quran is literally the word of Allah, and that the Sunnah was inspired by Allah. They say this because there are hundreds of commands in the Quran ordering Muslims to obey Muhammad, to believe in him, to follow his example. Since the Quran is supposed to be Allah speaking, the only way to obey Muhammad, to believe in him, and to follow him, is to know what he said and did. The Hadith represents the sole repository of these words and deeds. So, despite all evidence to the contrary, Muslims believe. What you are going to hear read from the Quran and Hadith, they believe that it is divinely inspired scripture, directly from Allah. The preponderance of this scripture is presented in Prophet of Doom. To provide some perspective on the scope of the coverage, you should know that the Quran, formatted like the book Prophet of Doom, which is a thousand pages, would be about two hundred pages long. Paired of its redundancy, it would be a quarter of that length. We'll analyze nearly ninety percent of that material. Turning to the Sunnah, the Hadith in Bukhari's collection represents 800 pages of Muhammadisms. The majority are duplicated several times in various sections. Most have multiple lines of transmitters or isnads for virtually identical traditions. Further, half of Bukhari's collections includes laws, procedures, or meaningless anecdotes that fall outside the scope of this study. Without this redundant and extraneous material, there are 50 pages of prime and pertinent reports. We'll cover 50% of this directly and reveal 30% indirectly through redundancy in Ishak and Tabari. Much of Muslims' work is duplicated in Bukhari. He has some unique traditions, though, and many important insights on the nature of jihad. Whenever we can glean fresh information from Imam Muslim, we will. The events presented by Tabari, the first Islamic historian, mirror those contained in Ishak's biographical account. There's a 70% overlap in their coverage of Muhammad's life and the formation of Islam. Devoid of this overlap, extraneous poetry and footnotes, their combined 1,500 pages of Islamic traditions over the period we will be studying could be distilled to 250 pages of hadith not memorialized elsewhere. Prophet of Doom analyzes 80% of these as they provide the most valuable insights into Islam. Ishak's biography and Tabari's history. Are comprised in their entirety of hadith. They are Sunnah, thus Islamic scripture. Their hadith feature chains of reporters, and they are in sync with other collections and with the Quran. The sole difference is the arrangement. Ishak and Tabari chose hadith that could be presented in the order they occurred. Without Ishak and Tabari, Islam would not exist, as Muhammad would be unknown. They alone provide the religion's skeleton, its context, and chronology. Without this grounding in place and time, the Quran is meaningless, and the remaining hadith are of diminished value. It would be like being a Christian without the Gospels. The Tabari translators tell us, 
Muhammad ibn Ishaq was the most influential and earliest biographer of the Prophet. His surah became the standard treatment of the events in Muhammad's life. Ishaq collected hadith a full century before anyone else. Muslims have no earlier or more accurate resource. The four generations of oral transmission that followed his collection could have done nothing but degrade the material. But sadly, Ishaq's original has been lost. What remains was edited by Hisham 65 years later. And Hisham said, I am omitting things which Ishaq recorded in this book. I have omitted things which are disgraceful to discuss and matters which would distress certain people. That is why Tabati is essential. He had a copy of Ishaq's Surat Rasul Allah when he composed his history. Rather than editing the Sira, he referenced Ishaq each time his hadith shed additional light on any subject, especially Islamic creation and the Satanic verses. By the time you have completed this review, you will know much more about Muhammad and fundamental Islam than most Muslims. You will understand him and his doctrine better than most scholars and clerics. You will see Muhammad as he saw himself. His motives and agenda will become as transparent as his method and means. Islam will no longer be a mystery. The only conundrum that will remain is why anyone believed this prophet. Muhammad and his deity created very little original material. Team Islam was into plagiarism. Most of the Quran was lifted from the Torah and Talmud. Apparently God ran out of good material when he finished the Bible. Muhammad aside, there are only four non-biblical characters in the Quran. Two represent mythical leaders of mythical lands. The third was Muhammad's biggest critic, his uncle Abu Lahab. The fourth was Alexander the Great, a Muslim prophet according to Allah. While all other names are the same, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, Joshua, Lot, Moses, Aaron, Jonah, David, Solomon, Mary, Jesus, who the Quran calls Esau, Satan, and Gabriel, their stories are not. The detailed historical events surrounding these lives so meticulously detailed by Jewish scribes were purposefully convoluted, ripped out of context in time, to justify Muhammad's thinly disguised agenda. I share this now so that you might know that without the inclusion of Bible characters and stories, the Quran and Hadith would be very thin on spirituality. We would be left with little more than temper tantrums, threats, and terror. No one would confuse it for a religion. As for the gross variance between the Bible and Quran, the Arachman Allah Muhammad team claimed that the 40 literate Jews who lived and witnessed these events, performed the miracles, and recorded the prophecies got them all wrong. Well, except for the overwhelming number of passages they copied. Then Muhammad claimed that he, an illiterate Arab, an enemy of the Jews, living 900 miles distant and 6 to 26 centuries after the fact, revealed the, in quotes, a truthful account, having corrected their deceptions. In an ignorant world, it must have sounded plausible. It is interesting, however, that neither Muhammad, or Rahman, nor Allah bothered to explain how or when these gross deceptions crept into the Bible. And this task becomes increasingly difficult for Muslims because their God said in Quran 80.13 that the Judeo-Christian scriptures were in good hands. In honored books exalted in dignity, kept pure and holy, written by the hands of scribes, honorable, pious, just, noble, and righteous. The general consensus among Islamic scholars is that the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, was corrupted when Jews failed to accept Christ. And the Christian Bible, the New Testament, was corrupted when Christians failed to accept Muhammad. The following hadith from their traditions forms the basis of this doctrinal view. It comes from Bukhari's Book of Hiring, Volume 3, Book 36, Number 471. It can also be found in the Noble Quran, attached to Surah 4146. Bukhari the prophet said, The example of the Jews, Christians, and Muslims is like the example of a man who employed Jewish laborers to work for him from morning till night for specific wages. They worked till midday, and then said, We do not need your money, which you have fixed for us, and let whatever we have done be annulled. 
The man said, Don't quit. Complete the rest and take your full wages. But they refused and went away. The man employed another batch after them and said to the Christians, Complete the rest, and yours will be the wages I had fixed for the first batch. So they worked until the time of Aser, afternoon, prayer. Then they said, Let what we have been done be annulled, and keep the wages you have promised. The man said, Complete the rest of the work, as only a little remains. But they refused. Thereafter he employed others, Muslims this time, and they worked till sunset. They received the wages of the two former batches, so they represented the example of the Jews and Christians, and then the Muslims who accepted the Quran and Sunnah which the Prophet brought. Recognizing this wasn't a very good explanation, and knowing that the story was a twisted rip-off of one of Christ's parables, the Islamic scholars who translated the passage added this footnote. The Jews refused to believe in the message of Jesus, so all their work was annulled. Similarly, the Christians refused to accept the message of Muhammad, and thus their work was annulled too. Such people were not rewarded, because they refused true faith and died unbelievers. They should have accepted the latest message. Their insistence on keeping their old religion deprived them of any reward. On the other hand, Muslims accepted the new religion and believed in all three messages. They deserved a full reward for their complete surrender to Allah. Unfortunately for Muslims, this scenario is impossible. How can one believe all three messages since they are radically different? More importantly, if Judeo-Christianity is a true message, what's the justification for a new religion? And as difficult as these questions are, the most troubling still lingers. How and when did the Judeo-Christian scriptures get corrupted? Fact is, they didn't. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, survives to this day. It serves as irrefutable proof that nothing has changed. It was translated 275 years before the Christian era. It matches today's Old Covenant with astonishing fidelity. Then you have the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were found by a Bedouin shepherd boy in the caves of Qumran. They date between 250 B.C. and 70 A.D. They were thus written during the very period Muhammad claims the Bible was corrupted. These 2,000-year-old scrolls prove that the foundation of Islam is fictitious. They are virtually indistinguishable from today's text. The New Covenant condemns the Islamic theory as well. By the time the Muslims said it was corrupted, there were hundreds of translations and as many as a 100,000 copies distributed throughout the civilized world. Do you suppose they were all brought together and altered in identical fashion just to spite Muhammad? Or is it more likely that Allah doesn't know what he's talking about? That's the crux of the issue. If the Bible wasn't corrupted in a massive and conspiratorial fashion, Islam can't be trusted. Correcting the Torah and Gospel, setting the record straight, returning to the true religion, were central to Muhammad's mission. If the scripture wasn't garbled, Islam loses its justification. If the Bible wasn't massively degraded to the point that it would be unrecognizable, the cornerstone of Islam is a lie. To believe that Team Islam was right, and that the Hebrew prophets were wrong, one has to dismiss the fact that most of the Quran's stories and characters were lifted from Jewish oral tradition in the Talmud. Additionally, the Medinan surahs say that Muhammad had to pay Jews for access to their scriptures during the formation of his religion. O oh, children of Israel, call to mind my, that's Allah's, favor which I bestowed on you, and believe in what I have revealed, verifying the Torah which is with you. Be not the first to deny the Quran. Neither take a mean price in exchange for my scriptures. In other words, don't sell Bible stories to Muhammad. Give them to him. Do not mix up the truth with falsehood, nor hide the truth when you know it. Quran 2.40 There are a dozen more verses like this, all designed to demean Jews for charging Muhammad when he needed more scripture to call his own. The Jews recognized the discrepancies between the accounts they had read to Muhammad and his convoluted revisions. It was obvious that the alterations were attributable to crises in his life rather than consistent with the lives of the biblical characters they had described. So they mocked Muhammad 
as you and I might have done had we been in their shoes. Had Muhammad invented his religion independent of the Bible, comparisons would be unnecessary if Muslims were not killing us while shouting, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater, they would be unimportant. But he did, and they are, so it is. The Judeo-Christian faiths are wholly independent and separate from Islam. They neither gain nor lose any authenticity from a comparison. The Bible doesn't mention Muhammad, Muslims, Islam, Allah, Mecca, or the Kaaba, although there are some foreboding predictions about these people, their doctrine and spirit. But the reverse is not true. For reasons we shall discuss, Muhammad fancied himself a Jewish prophet, a Messiah even, He claimed that Islam was the original religion of Abraham. He professed that Adam, Noah, Moses, and Esau, Jesus, were really Muslims. And as we have seen, he claimed that the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Gospels were inspired scripture directly from his God. Then he said they were all corrupt, which made his message necessary. This is underscored in the 163rd verse of the 4th Surah. Surely we, that's Allah, have revealed to you, Muhammad, as we revealed to Noah and the prophets after him, and we revealed to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and their offspring, and the tribes of Israel, and Jesus and Job and Jonah and Aaron and Solomon. We gave to David the book of Psalms, and we sent apostles and Moses, to whom Allah spoke his word directly, All of these apostles of good news and warners were sent so that the people should not have a plea against Allah. None of these men were apostles. Ishmael, Esau, Jacob, Job, Aaron, and Solomon weren't even prophets. David was one of many writers of Psalms, and Moses spoke to Yahweh, not Allah. In Quran 3.3 we read, He, that's Allah, has verily revealed to you this book, the Quran, in truth, and confirmation of the books revealed before, as indeed he had revealed the Torah and the Gospel. This is confirmed. Surah 5, verse 46. Later, in the train of the prophets, we, Allah, sent Jesus, that's Esau, son of Mary, confirming the Torah which had been sent down before him, and gave him the Gospel containing guidance and light, which corroborated the earlier Torah. Then... Quran 5, verse 47. Let the people of the gospel, Christians, judge by what has been revealed in it by Allah. And? Quran 5, verse 48. To you we have revealed the Quran containing the truth, confirming the earlier revelations, the Torah, Psalms, and Gospels, and preserving them from change and corruption. So judge between them by what has been revealed by Allah. We will judge between them because Muhammad gave us no choice. Yet I will not attempt to validate the biblical account. It isn't the purpose of this study. And the Bible gains nothing from repudiating the Islamic corruptions of its scriptures. Islam, however, has no credibility unless Muhammad can disprove the biblical accounting as he based Islam on his variant of the Torah. Allah wasn't the least bit ambiguous when he said that the Torah, Psalms, and Gospels were his divinely inspired scriptures. But that's impossible, since the Torah and Quran contradict each other on most every page. The message of salvation proclaimed in the Gospels is the antithesis of Islam. To say they were all inspired by the same God is irrational, a logical impossibility. In Quran 2.59, Allah lambasted the Jews. The wicked, Jews, changed and perverted the word we, Allah, had spoken to a word distorted. Because of their egregious behavior, the Jews became like apes, despised. But then in the fifth surah, Allah says of the earlier revelations, the Torah and Gospels, that he preserved them. So what is it? Why correct that which has been preserved from change? And more importantly, why are they so different if they are from the same God? All of this makes you wonder why someone didn't have the presence of mind to edit the Quran before they claimed it was divine.
The Quran acknowledges that the Bible is ancient history's most detailed and accurate account of a people and their relationship with their Creator. The Hebrew Scriptures are not only the Quran's most frequently quoted resource, its characters and stories dominate each of Islam's holy books. And up to the point Muhammad corrupted them, he was on solid ground, for the vast majority of the places and events described in the Bible have been shown by archaeologists to be valid historical depictions. None have ever been shown to be inaccurate. Each time an attempt is made, and there have been thousands, the critic finds himself impaled on the archaeologist's spade. Yet apart from the Bible, there is no such evidence in the Quran. Not a single historical artifact has been found to justify its claims. There is no reference to Allah, Muhammad, Mecca, or the Kaaba, independent of the Quran or Hadith. And the Quran itself is a disjointed hodgepodge, not even chronological, much less historical. Unrelated subjects are strung together without intelligible transitions, rhyme, or reason. Since the Islamic scripture is based upon stories lifted from Genesis and Exodus, we're going to start at the beginning and review what Muhammad had to say about our Genesis. The Bible has but one version. Islam has many. Since the Bible's account preceded Islam's by 3,000 years, we'll review it first. I'd like to set the stage. Yahweh's revelations of our beginning was given to man 4,000 years ago. There were no scientists or even word for science. The language of astronomical creation, calculus, wouldn't be invented for four millennia. The language of life, DNA, was a concept well beyond this time. I say this to reveal something that should be obvious. The creation story was not intended to be a scientific explanation of how God made the universe, although it is precisely accurate scientifically. It was a spiritual explanation of why he created it. The explanation of how was scores of centuries beyond the language of the time, and it was unimportant. But for those who are interested in the scriptural presentation of the creation account, I encourage you to read the Haya chapter on existence in Yada Yahweh. Islam's account of creation is a wee bit less credible and a touch less consistent. From the English translation of the history of Al-Tabadi, Creation to the Flood, we find. Jews came to the prophet and asked him about the creation of the heavens and the earth. Allah didn't bother to explain our beginnings in his Quran, so Muhammad felt obliged to help him out. He said, Allah created the earth on Sunday and Monday. He created the mountains and the uses they possess on Tuesday. On Wednesday, he created trees, water, cities, and the cultivated and barren land. On Thursday, he created heaven. On Friday, he created stars, the sun, the moon, and angels until three hours remained. In the first of these three hours, he created the terms, who would live and who would die. In the second, he cast harm on everything that is useful for mankind. And in the third, Adam, and had him dwell in paradise. Did you notice how readily Muhammad was willing to speak for Allah? It's as if speaking for God was a regular part of his routine, almost as if he knew everything his God knew. Yet judging by his answer, Muhammad would have done better if he had solicited advice. He, unlike Moses, has God creating the earth and vegetation before the sun and stars. For those that don't know... Look closely at the Genesis account and you'll see that the sun and moon were not created on the fourth day, but only became visible as signs. In Allah's case, there is no excuse. For Allah says, I swear by the stars and by the signs of the zodiac. In the opening verse of the 85th surah, and he, unlike Yahweh, has no interest in developing a relationship with man. In Quran 51:56, Allah shares, I have created jinn, that's demons, and men only to worship me. I do not want anything from them. Muhammad claims that cities existed and that land was cultivated before man was created. And the idea of God casting harm on everything useful gives us our first clue as to who Allah actually might be. 
Finally, he obliterated the stated purpose of Islam by saying that the terms of life and death were predestined by Allah. If we have no choice, we don't need a religion. But as strange as all of that seems, why did the prophet of the all-knowing Allah contradict himself in the next paragraph, saying, Tabari, the messenger took me by the hand and said, Allah created soil on Saturday. Upon it, he created the mountains on Sunday. He created the trees on Wednesday, scattered animals on Thursday, and made Adam as the last of his creatures after the afternoon prayer on Friday. Allah begins on Saturday rather than Sunday and Monday. After taking a much-needed rest on Tuesday, he forgot the city's water and cultivation and dispenses with the creation of the sun, moon, and stars, as well as paradise. Then Allah creates man after the afternoon prayer. So who was praying and to whom? Tabari. The Jews asked the prophet, What about Sunday? The messenger answered, On it Allah created the earth and spread it out. They asked about Monday, and he replied, On it he created Adam. So much for the afternoon prayer. Then they asked about Saturday and mentioned God resting on it. The prophet got very angry, so Allah revealed it to him. We have created the heavens and the earth, and what is between them in six days, and fatigue did not touch us. This became Quran 50.38. It's interesting that Allah was of no help providing Muhammad with a rational explanation of creation, or even help keeping his stories straight. But when it came time to embarrass the God of the Jews, he jumped in with a handy Quranic revelation. It says, in essence, my God is better than your God, because my God didn't need to rest. But that's a problem. The gods are supposed to be the same. And the Bible tells us that only one spirit thought he was better than Yahweh that of the fallen angel Halal bin Shakar, known in the West as Lucifer. However, Muhammad didn't understand that the Genesis account was designed to convey spiritual truth. Yahweh's pattern of 6 plus 1 ultimately became the framework upon which his relationship with man was built. Unfortunately, Muhammad's testimony puts us in a quandary. It is too foolish to be from a literate man and yet his stories are loosely based upon Genesis, the world's best-known written account of our beginnings. I believe the following hadith provides some insights into how Muhammad came to know these things and upon whose authority he claimed to be speaking. Bukhari, a Jewish rabbi, Abdullah bin Salam, approached the messenger. I am going to ask you three things which nobody knows except the prophet. Then how would the rabbi know them? What is the first portent of the hour? What will be the first meal taken in paradise? Why does a child resemble its father? And why does it resemble its mother? Allah's apostles said, Gabriel has just now told me of the answers. Gabriel, from among all the angels, is the enemy of the Jews. The first portent of the hour will be a fire that will bring the people from east to west. The first meal of paradise will be caudite lobe of fish liver. As for the resemblance of a child to its parents, if a man has sexual intercourse with his wife and gets discharged first, the child will resemble him. And if the woman gets discharged first, the child will resemble her. On that, the rabbi said, I testify that you are the apostle of Allah and that the Jews are liars. It's hard to believe that anyone believes this is scripture. Salam was one of two Jews Ishak believes sold out to Muhammad. He was in all likelihood responsible for providing the scripture the prophet corrupted to compile his Quran. And Gabriel was neither an enemy of the Jews nor who Muhammad claimed him to be. I am certain Islam's prophet mistook Halal bin Shakar, better known as Satan, for Gabriel. The totality of the Quran and Hadith allow for no other conclusion. Returning to the creation tale, we discover a talking planet. Tabari. Allah said to the heavens and the earth, Come willingly or unwillingly. They said, We come willingly. Allah said to the heavens, Cause my sun, my moon, and my stars to rise. 
To the earth, he said, split your rivers and bring forth fruit. Both replied, we come willingly. At this point, we are using Tabari as our primary source of Islamic scripture. While he quotes traditions from Ibn Ishaq, Hisham abrogated this portion of Muhammad's hadith from the original collection. That said, I will continue to include Quran quotations within the Tabari narrative, peppering them with Bukhari hadith. Muhammad takes us through a spirited debate on what was created first. Tabari I heard Muhammad say, the first thing created by Allah was the pen, and Allah said to it, write. It proceeded that very hour to write whatever is going to be. This is an essential insight into Islam. The religion is entirely fatalistic. There is no choice. Everything, including our eternity, is predestined. This is the inverse of Judeo-Christianity, where we are given the choice to love God or reject Him. Returning to the pen, what language do you suppose it wrote? Was it some form of the Akkadian tongue in cuneiform? After all, the stylus produced the first written language on planet Earth. Or was it Egyptian hieroglyphics, which appeared next? Could it have been Hebrew, the language of Yahweh's first revelation, the language of the Torah? After all, Allah claims He revealed it first. No. Allah says it was written in Arabic because the pen wrote the Quran before man was created. Allah lies and says, And before it, the book of Musa, that's Moses, was a guide. And this, Quran, is a book verifying it in the Arabic language. Quran 46002. Recognizing, however, that written Arabic didn't even exist until the late 7th century. And then in Quran 3927, We have coined for man in this Quran every kind of parable in order that they may receive admonition. It is a Quran in Arabic without any crookedness therein in order that they may guard against evil. Quran 41, verse 3. A scripture book whereof the verses are explained in every detail. A Quran in Arabic for people who have knowledge. Then, Quran 41.44, Had we sent this as a Quran in the language other than Arabic, they would have said, Why are not its verses explained in detail? What? A foreign tongue, a book, not in Arabic, and a messenger, an Arab? Say unto them, Muhammad, it is a guide to those who believe, and for those who do not believe it, there is a deafness in their ears, and it is blindness in their eyes. For those listening to the audio version of this book, it is difficult for you to see where the parentheses were added to the Quran scripture, filling in the words that were necessary to make Allah's statements sensible. But about a third of the last passage read had words that were added by the translators within parentheses, just so that Allah's Arabic revelation would make sense. There are a couple of problems with the Arabic theory. Written Arabic evolved among Syrian Christians as a stylistic derivative of Aramaic in the late 6th and early 7th century A.D. There is no evidence the alphabet made its way to Muhammad's Mecca until after the Quran was revealed. Even then, the Quran is filled with many non-Arabic words, including the word Quran, which the Syrian Christians defined as to recite or to preach. Tabari I heard the prophet say, the first thing created by Allah was the pen. Allah said to it, write. The pen asked, what shall I write? Allah replied, write what is predestined. I'll give Muhammad a pass on the talking pen because it makes no less sense than a talking earth. But this I've got to know. If the pen knew all that was predestined, why didn't it know what Allah wanted it to do? Tabari explains, there are people who consider predestination untrue. Then they consider the Quran untrue. People merely carry out what is a foregone conclusion decided by predestination and written down by the pen. Yes, folks, they actually believe this stuff. And that's because this passage was crafted to explain the Quran 68th surah called The Pen. I, Allah, call to witness the pen and what it inscribes. Without the Hadith, you wouldn't know what pen God was talking about. 
The second verse is delicious. The Lord is possessed to tell his lone prophet. Quran 68, verse 2. You are not demented, demon-possessed, or mad. Then he says, There is surely an unending reward for you. That reward became the means, method, and motivation for creating, staffing, and promulgating Islam. The following Bukhari Hadith confirms Muhammad's lack of choice and Muhammad's dearth of prophetic credentials. Bukhari, Allah's Apostle, the true and truly inspired, said, As it relates to your creation, every one of you is collected in the womb of his mother for the first forty days, and then he becomes a clot for another forty days, and then a piece of flesh for another forty days. A four-month gestation isn't even half right. Then Allah sends an angel to write four words. He writes his deeds, time of his death, the means of his livelihood, and whether he will be wretched or blessed. Moving on, the pen gathers rivals for its pole position in the race of creation. Tabari, I ask the prophet, where was Allah before his creation? Muhammad replied, he was in a cloud with no air underneath or above it. A cloud without air. Now there's one for the science classes. Then Allah created his throne upon the water. If there were clouds, water, and a throne, how did the pen come first? I'm sure the prophet will clear this up, so let's listen to a hadith from one of his companions. Like so many traditions, this one is found in both Tabati and Bukhari. Some people came to the messenger, entered his presence, and said, Give us gifts! Muhammad's militants were mercenaries. The prophet bribed his way to prosperity. This continued until it annoyed him. Then they left. Some other people came in and said, We have come to greet the messenger of Allah and become knowledgeable about the religion and ask about the beginning of the world. He said, Allah existed while there was nothing else. His throne was upon the water, and all that was going to be written on the memorial tablet before anything else was created. Then Allah created the seven heavens. Just then, someone came to me and said, That camel of yours is gone. I went out and found that she was out of my sight. I surely wish that I would have let her go, so that I would not have missed the rest of the prophet's remarks. Okay, let me see if I understand this. The pen was created first, but before it was created, Allah created his throne. The throne was on the water, which was yet to be created. Then we had writing on a tablet that had yet to be created, so that Allah could tell us that there were seven heavens, which were created before or after the earth, depending on which version you believe. Bottom line, the camel's gone. That's about all we know for sure. The Bukhari version of the runaway camel ends with this insight into how Muhammad conveyed his inspired revelations and how they were ultimately retained and passed along to us as scripture. Bukhari One day the prophet stood up amongst us for a long period and informed us about the beginning of creation. He talked about everything in detail. He ended his speech by mentioning how the people of paradise will enter the garden and how the people of hell will enter the fire. Some remembered what he said and some forgot. Muhammad's disciples weren't the only ones who had trouble remembering this stuff. Bukhari. The prophet said, It is a bad thing that some of you say, I have forgotten such and such a verse of the Quran, for truly I have been caused by Allah to forget it. So you must keep on reciting the Quran, because it escapes faster than a runaway camel. Since memories were fleeting, to be fair, I say we give Muhammad another chance. Surely he'll straighten all this out. After all, a billion people trust this man with their soul. Tabari. When Allah wanted to create the heavens and the earth, he grabbed a fistful of small rocks in the water. Then he opened his fist with the rocks, and they rose in the form of smoke. Then Allah fashioned the seven heavens and extended the earth in two days. He finished the creation on the seventh day. He created the footstool after the pen, and then the throne. Thereafter he created the air and darkness. Then he created the water and placed his throne upon it. He was in a cloud with no air underneath or above it. Thus the messenger reported. So that explains it. 
it makes perfect sense. Muhammad was making this stuff up as he went along. Now I ask you, since it's obvious that his scripture was contrived, what else do you suppose Muhammad made up as he went along? Allah and Islam, perhaps? And that's the point, really. The more you're exposed to Muhammad and his religion, the more you will come to understand the nature and purpose of Islam. There are two reasons I'm sharing these improbable and variant Islamic creation accounts. First, I promised that we would start at the beginning and cover Muhammad's creation of Islam chronologically, starting with his version of the world's beginnings. We will go step by step through his corruption of Adam, Noah, and Abraham, and see how he used the oldest patriarchs to establish the newest dogma. Second, I want you to know Muhammad and Allah, to see them as they really are, each time they propose things that are logically impossible, contradictory, or twisted, you'll be able to judge their sincerity, validity, and veracity. By way of example, Muhammad had to make the Kaaba, Allah's house and rock pile to pagan gods, seem worthy of veneration. Tabari. Allah created the ancient house upon the water on four pillars. He did this 2,000 years before he created the world. Islam's credibility is based upon making the Kaaba, the black cube in Mecca, a legitimate monotheistic shrine. Forget for a moment that this story contradicts Muhammad's earlier testimony. The Kaaba was a wreck. During Muhammad's day, it was constructed of unhewn and unmortared rocks. It didn't even have a roof. Even today, it's so unattractive, it has to be covered with a giant prayer blanket. And that's after having been rebuilt ten times. Such a building and I use that term loosely, is beneath God's status. Forget that it was a pagan shrine housing over 360 idols. We still have to deal with three wholly different versions of who made it. In different places of the Hadith and Quran, Muhammad claims that the Kaaba's builder was Allah, Adam, and Abraham. Well, at least they all start with the letter A. There are many more creation variations, but I'd be remiss if I didn't share my favorite. The whole earth was placed upon a big fish, the very same fish that swallowed Jonah. In this version we discover, Tabari, when Allah wanted to create the creation, he brought forth smoke from the water. The smoke hovered loftily over it. He called it heaven. Then he dried out the water and made it earth. He split it and made seven earths on Sunday. He created the earth upon a big fish, that being the fish mentioned in the Quran. By the pen, the fish was in the water. The water was on the back of a small rock. The rock was on the back of an angel. The angel was on a big rock. The big rock was in the wind. The fish became agitated. As a result, the earth quaked, so that Allah anchored the mountains and made it stable. This is why the Quran says Allah made the earth firmly anchored mountains, lest it shake you up. Dr. Sue says nothing on these guys. This is better than one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Before we give up and go fishing, I'd like to share what Islam had to say about the creation of man. It was one of Muhammad and Allah's favorite subject, covered countless times in Hadith and Quran. Since neither were capable of prophecy or miracles, man's existence was used to prove Allah's existence. Tabari Allah created Adam from sticky clay, meaning viscous and sweet-smelling, from slime, being stinking. It became stinking slime after having been compact soil. Allah formed Adam with his own hand. That became Quran 1526. So if a Muslim calls you a stinking slime ball, thank him. It's a compliment, I think. Yet Allah, forming us out of slime, is insulting, and it's contradictory. The referenced verse says, Quran 15, verse 26, We fashion man from fermented clay, stinking slime, dried tingling hard as we fashion jinn, which are demons, from white-hot flame. Elsewhere in the Quran, God created man from dust, spurting water, contemptible water, a drop of semen, an embryo, a single sperm, 
Who do you suppose that might have been? A single cell. A chewed up lump of flesh. Extract of base fluid. Inordinate haste. Or simply, weakness. Depending upon where you look. There are 30 creation accounts and 22 variations. Of course, this must all make sense because Allah insists there are no contradictions in the Quran. Among these fairy tales, there's a problem. It's incumbent upon a belief system to answer the why of creation. Why are we here? The answer should be attached to the creation story, but Islam doesn't bother. Worse, Muhammad's ultimate answer is indicting. Allah said, I have created jinn, who are demons, and men only to worship me. I do not want anything from them. Islam is devoid of choice, and worship without choice is slavery. It would be like you or me having a tape recorder blast, You are great, all day long. God is not so insecure he needs a praise machine, nor so lame he made one as imprecise as man. The Bible says Yahweh created Adam, the Hebrew word for man, out of the dust or elements, breathing his spirit into us so that we would be like him spiritually. Unlike the angels, we were made in his image. Our spirit has godly characteristics, enabling us to know Yahweh, to communicate with him, and to choose to have a relationship with him. If we wish to praise him after we have come to know him, that's fine. But it is not why we were created. This conflicts with Islam. Although the God of the crown sounds like Muhammad, Islam dispenses with the in his image idea because Islam's God and man are supposed to have nothing in common. There is a hadith attributed to Muhammad in which he passed a man beating a slave. He told him to stop because Allah made Adam in the slave's image. Being crafted in the slave's image was designed to underscore Muhammad's concept of Islam, a religion named submission, a religion without choice. Yahweh wants us to choose. Allah wants us to submit. One wants to be loved, the other feared. There may be a reason the Islamic prostration requires one to bow their head toward hell while their posterior moons the heavens. The Islamic creation account continues with this hadith. Tabari. Allah sent Gabriel to the earth to bring him some clay. The earth said, I take refuge in Allah against you mutilating me. So Gabriel returned without having taken any clay and said, Lord, the earth took refuge in you, and I granted its wish. Allah then sent Michael, and exactly the same thing happened. Then he sent the angel of death. He took some soil from the earth and made a mixture. He did not take it from a single place, but took red, white, and black soil. Therefore, the children of Adam came out different. We're different races, according to Islam, because the stinking slime was red, white, and black. We owe our existence to the angel of death. But Allah wasn't finished. Tabari. He went up with the soil, then moistened it so that it became sticky clay. The soil changed and became stinking. This is what Allah meant when he said, from slime, stinking. The Lord Almighty sent Iblis, Arabic for Satan, to take some skin from the earth, both sweet and salty, and Allah created Adam from it. For this reason, he was named Adam. He was created from the skin... Adim, of the earth. As for God's only illiterate messenger, Muhammad didn't know that Adam was actually the Hebrew word for man. The lesson here is, if you're going to plagiarize, you ought to be more careful. Otherwise, you're apt to mistake Lucifer for Gabriel and attribute creation to the wrong God. Was this inspired by the creator of the universe? Or did Muhammad say... Tabari. Allah caused Adam's clay to ferment. He left it lying around for forty nights. Iblis, Satan, used to come to it and kick it with his foot, whereupon it made sounds. Then Iblis entered Adam's mouth and left from his posterior, and entered his ass and left from his mouth. Then he said, You are not something for making sounds. 
What then were you created for? If I am given authority over you, I shall ruin you. Muhammad wants us to know that Satan flows within our nature, or at least within his. Bukhari. Satan circulates in human beings as blood flows in our bodies. The next segment of Demonic Delusion is revealing. After exploring Adam's posterior, Satan told the angels, Don't be afraid of that one, the partially fermented Adam, for Allah is solid, whereas this one is hollow. Well, I don't know much about the consistency of fermenting humans. I know that Allah was synonymous with the largest rock of the Kaaba, the black stone. Rocks are indeed solid. God is spirit by all sane accounts, which would make him the antithesis of solid. Satan may have given us another clue. Just for giggles, let's canvas the remaining accounts. We are told, Tabari. When Allah's spirit entered Adam's head, he sneezed. The angel said, Praise be to Allah. When it reached his stomach, he grew hungry. When it reached his feet, he ran for food. This explains why the Quran says, Man was created of inordinate haste. That became Quran 2137. Whenever something of Allah's spirit moved in Adam's body, it became flesh and blood. When the blown spirit reached his navel, he looked at his body and was pleased to see its beauty. Why would Adam have a navel? Did he have a mother? An umbilical cord? Shouldn't Adam have been the only man in creation without a navel? Tabari. And he, Allah, taught Adam all the names as follows. He taught him the name of everything, down to fart and little fart. That's what it says. And Adam told each creature about its name and referred to its genus. Allah said, I know what you do not know. No kidding, you're pretending to be God. If we, speaking of angels, are not better than Adam is, we are at least more knowledgeable, because we existed before him, and the nations were created before him. How could the nations have been created before the first man? The Islamic answer is embarrassing. You will soon discover that the Quran and Hadith claim that the Muslim prophet Alexander the Great found an extraterrestrial nation around a celestial mud pit in which our sun sets. Really? This Hadith sounds innocuous enough until you connect it to the Quran. Tabari. When the angels boasted about their knowledge, they were tested. Allah taught Adam all the names. Then he presented them to the angels and said, Tell me the names of these if you speak the truth in saying that you are more knowledgeable than what I created. The angels hurriedly sought repentance. Allah said, Adam, tell them their names. Muhammad claims the Quran was revealed by an angel. But that's not good if Allah's angels are prone to deceit. And if they are so stupid, they don't know the word for swine or know a rock from a god. Tabari. Adam began to call everything by its name, and nation after nation was presented to him. Allah preferred Adam to the angels with respect to knowledge. Nation after nation was presented to Adam, of all people. But before you laugh it off as irreverent, irrational, and irrelevant, consider this. Each hadith was tied to the Quran. So while it's irreverent and irrational, it's not irrelevant. Tabari. Each day of the six in which he created corresponds to a thousand years. The conclusion is that the time elapsed from when Allah first began creating his creatures to when he finished is seven thousand years. As proved by us earlier with the help of evidential statements, there is a duration of seven thousand years from the time when our Lord finished to the moment of the annihilation. While we're not told why Allah wants to destroy the world, we are told when. Tabari. The Prophet said, I was sent immediately before the coming day of doom. I preceded it like one preceding that one, referring to his index and middle finger. Tabari. He said, Allah will not make this nation of Islam incapable of lasting half a day, a day being a thousand years, 
Consequently, based upon the prophet's authority, what remained of the time was half a day of the days of which one is a thousand years. The conclusion is that the time that had elapsed to the prophet's statement corresponds to 6,500 years. This means that the earth should have been annihilated 500 years after Muhammad shared his divine insight in 610 A.D. Last time I checked, the year 1110 came and went without incident. The only mystery is, why didn't Islam go with it? Bukhari I relate the traditions of Allah's apostle for you, for I would rather fall from the sky than attribute something to him falsely. But when I tell you a thing which is between you and me, then no doubt war is guile. I heard Allah's apostle say, In the world's last days there will appear some young foolish people who will use the Quran's best speech to abandon Islam. Their belief will not go beyond their throats, so wherever you meet them, kill them, for he who kills them will get a reward on the day of doom. Muhammad just said, Kill a Muslim and earn a prize. Returning to Islamic science, this is how the sun works. Tabari. With your Lord there is neither night nor day. The light of the heavens comes from the light of his face. That means Allah was the sun, stars, and moon. A standard issue pagan god. And while that's not a very good start, it gets worse. The sun not only talks, it bows down, worships Allah, and rises in the west. Bukhari. I walked hand in hand with the prophet when the sun was about to set. We did not stop looking at it. The prophet asked, Do you know where the sun goes down at sunset? I replied, Allah and his apostle know better. He said, It travels until it falls down and prostrates itself underneath the throne. The angels who are in charge of the sun prostrate themselves also. The sun asks permission to rise again. It is permitted. Then it will prostrate itself again, but this prostration will not be accepted. The sun then says, My Lord, where do you command me to rise, from where I set or from where I rose? Allah will order the sun to return whence it has come. And so the sun will rise in the west, and that is the interpretation of the statement of Allah in the Quran, and the sun runs its fixed course for a term decreed, that is, the decree of Allah the All-Knowing. Quran 36.38 The Quran's 36th surah confirms this foolishness. A sign for them is the night. We withdraw from the day, and behold, they are plunged into darkness. The sun keeps revolving in its orbit at the dispensation of the All-Knowing, and the moon... We have measured for her the mansions until she returns like dried date stalks. It is not permitted for the sun to overtake the moon, nor can the night outstrip the day. The sun and the day represent Yahweh. The moon and night symbolize Satan. The spirit of Islam has put us on notice. In his world, in his religion, he is in charge. Each just swims along, floating in its own orbit, as a sign, as in a race. And we made similar vessels, chariots, for them to ride. But we could have drowned them if we pleased. The revealing spirit of Islam couldn't have been more foolish if he had tried. Swimming deeper into the vessel of Islamic cosmology, we discover... Tabari... Gabriel brings to the sun a garment of luminosity from the light of Allah's throne, according to the measure of the hours of the day. The garment is longer in the summer and shorter in the winter, and of intermediate length in the autumn and the spring. The sun puts on that garment as one of you here puts on his clothes. The sun wears clothes, and like us, their length varies depending upon the season. It even has a butler attending to its needs. I bet you didn't know that. According to Allah's prophet, Satan's hell, not God's son, generates heat. Bukhari. Allah's apostle said, If it is very hot, the severity of the heat is from the raging of the hell fire. As erroneous as all this is, Muhammad had no excuse. He could have said, I don't have a clue. He could have studied the writings of the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians. 
They had it figured out a thousand years before Muhammad's day. In that the authority of the Quran, of Allah himself and Islam, hangs upon his trustworthiness. This dim-witted delirium is distressing. Muhammad wasn't through embarrassing himself. He said, Tabari, I heard Cobb, the rabbi, tell a marvelous story about the sun and the moon. He said that the sun and the moon will be like two hamstrung oxen flung into hell. Ibn Abbas, one of Muhammad's companions, contorted with anger and exclaimed three times, Cobb is lying. This is something Jewish he wants to interject into Islam. Allah is too majestic and noble to mete out punishments where there is obedience to him. How could he punish two servants, these servants being the sun and the moon, that are praised for constant obedience? May Allah curse that rabbi. How insolent is he toward Allah, and what a tremendous fabrication he has told about these obedient servants. Mind you, he's having a tizzy fit because Muhammad had said that the sun and moon were obedient servants meaning good Muslims. So if the rabbi deserved to be cursed for his story, what do you suppose would be the appropriate punishment for Muhammad and his pals? And before you answer, remember the souls of a billion people hang in the balance. Ask another way. If you were given a choice, would you trust your eternity to this messenger? Ibn Abbas took a piece of wood and started to hit the ground with it. He did that for some time. Then lifting his head, he threw away the wood and said, You want me to tell you what I heard the messenger say about the sun and the moon and the beginning of creation and how things went with them? We said we would. Islam's lone prophet, Allah's only messenger, the Quran's singular voice, is about to prove whether or not he's worthy of our trust. When the messenger was asked about that, he replied, when Allah was done with his creation, and only Adam remained to be created, he created two sons from the light of his throne. His foreknowledge told him that he would efface one and change it to a moon. So the moon is smaller in size than the sun. Islam's prophet, the Quran's source, was either deceived, lying, or delusional when he said, The moon was a sun. Muhammad continued, if Allah had left the two sons as he created them, night would not have been distinguishable from day. A fasting person would not know when he must fast. A woman would not know how to reckon the period of her impurity. Muslims would not know the time of the pilgrimage. Allah was too concerned with his slaves to do such a thing. Muhammad's hadith and Allah's Quran speak with the same voice. Tabari Allah thus sent Gabriel to drag his wing three times over the face of the moon, which at the time was a sun. He effaced its luminosity and left the light in it. This is what Allah means. In Quran 17.12, We have blotted out the sign of the night, and we have made the sign of the day something to see by. The blackness you can see, as lines on the moon, is a trace of the blotting. Not only was Muhammad's Sunnah wrong, the Prophet destroyed the credibility of Allah's Quran. Tabari Kawa asked Ali, Caliph at the time, O commander of the faithful, what is that smudge in the moon? Ali replied, Don't you read the Quran? It says we have blotted out the sign of the night, effacing it. That smudge is a trace of the blotting. Ali was right. The Quran says this very thing in Surah 17.12. That was bad. This is worse. Allah then created for the sun a chariot with 360 handholds from the luminosity in the light of the throne and entrusted 360 of the angels inhabiting the lower heaven with the sun and its chariot, each of them gripping one of those handholds. Allah also entrusted 360 angels with the moon. I can see you shaking your heads. You must think I'm making this stuff up. There's no way a religion this stupid could have survived a week, much less 1,400 years, right? But I didn't, and it did. And in fact, one of the reasons I've given you so much of this is because of the way Muslims defend Islam's foolishness. They always accuse those with the courage to expose their scriptures of taking them out of context. So I have, and will, 
give you ample reason to rebuke such criticism. The more you know, the worse it gets. And by presenting Islam's creation account in such detail, I am exposing you to the mindset of Muhammad, the originator of these stories. I want you to think about the character deficiency that would prompt someone to speak such lies in the name of God. More than anything, I want you to contemplate his motivations. Why would he tell his followers that Allah had conveyed such things to him? Why did Muhammad feel the need to present himself as an authority, as the authority? What did he want? What did he have to gain? Muhammad's suicidal act of self-incrimination continued with this. Tabari. Then the prophet said, For the sun and the moon, Allah created easts and wests on the two sides of the earth and the two rims of heaven. There are a hundred and eighty springs in the west of black clay. This is why Allah's word said, He found the sun setting in a muddy spring. That becomes Quran 1886. The black clay bubbles and boils like a pot when it boils furiously. The 18th surah, aptly named the cave, is the most foolish in the Quran. Muhammad's prophetic credentials were challenged in the wake of his satanic verses. So he was forced to reveal enlightened answers to a series of probing questions. Unfortunately, cut off from his Hanith and Jewish sources, the Prophet's answers were particularly pathetic. He claimed that Alexander the Great was a Muslim sent by Allah to explore the sunrise and sunset. Quran 18, verse 83. They ask you about Dhul Karnain, who Muslim scholars claim is Alexander the Great. Say, I will cite something of his story. We will give him authority in the land and means of accomplishing his goals. So he followed a path until he reached the setting place of the sun. He saw that it set in black, muddy, hot water. Near it he found people. The Quran goes on to speak of punishing extraterrestrials and of the unprotected souls in the realm of the sunrise. Since Muhammad was willing to spew this rubbish with reckless abandon, and since Allah was willing to corroborate it in the Quran, why does anyone believe them? Why kill for them? Why die for them? Tabari. Allah's apostle continued, Allah created an ocean three farkas, that's 918 kilometers, removed from heaven. Waves contained, it stands in the air by the command of Allah. No drop of it is spilled. All the oceans are motionless, but that ocean flows at the speed of an arrow. The sun, moon, and retrograde stars, actually planets, by which Allah swears in the Quran, 81.15, run like the sun and moon race. All of the other stars are suspended from heaven as lamps are from mosques, and circulate together, praising Allah. The Prophet said, If you wish to have this made clear, look to the circulation of the sphere, alternately, here and there. Imagine teaching this Quranic lesson in science class. For your edification, Quran 81 says, I swear by the stars that run their course and hide themselves. They are my witnesses. And I swear by the night when it departs. Most surely this Quran is the word of an honored messenger, a mighty, powerful person of great rank and authority, one to be obeyed. My people, your companion, Muhammad, is not a demon-possessed madman. Surely he has seen him. Allah, Satan, Lucifer, Gabriel, which one? This is not the utterance of an accursed devil. These are not the words of Satan. This passage is fraught with more portent than I care to cover at this time. However, I would like to plant some seeds. Only Lucifer would swear by the stars and by night, for he was the morning star and became the prince of darkness. The angels who followed him became demons. They live to deceive men and are capable of possessing them, driving them mad. Yet more typically, they lure men astray by seducing them with delusions of grandeur and promising them power, as this verse confirms. According to the Bible, angels are God's implements. They're just messengers. They have no free will. They must submit and obey. It should be no surprise, then, considering Halal bin Shakar, Lucifer's influence, that man's relationship to Allah and Islam is predicated upon the only type of relationship Satan ever knew. 
The angelic realm is like the military. A mutineer can choose to follow a pirate, but that act immediately severs their relationship with and involvement in the Navy. If the consequence of a single act of disobedience is immediate disassociation, imprisonment, or death, it's not a choice, it's rebellion. Let's see how Professor Mohammed embarrasses himself next. Tabari. When the sun rises upon its chariot from one of those springs, it is accompanied by 360 angels with outspread wings. When Allah wishes to test the sun and the moon, showing his servants a sign and thereby getting them to obey, the sun tumbles from the chariot and falls into the deep end of the ocean. When Allah wants to increase the significance of the sign and frighten his servants severely, all of the sun falls and none of it remains in the chariot. That is a total eclipse of the sun. It is a misfortune for the sun. No, it's a misfortune for Muhammad, Allah. Islam, and Muslims. The prophet ended this lunacy by claiming he preached to extraterrestrials. Allah created two cities out in space, each with 10,000 gates, each six kilometers distant from each other. That makes the extraterrestrial cities bigger than the earth itself. By Allah, were those people not so many and so noisy, all the inhabitants of this world would hear the loud crash made by the sun falling when it rises and when it sets. Gabriel took me to them during my night journey from the sacred mosque. That would be the Kaaba. To the farthest mosque. That would be the Jewish temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. I told the people of these cities to worship Allah. But they refuse to listen to me. As should we on planet Earth. Islam's delusional creation account goes on and on. The sun is brought to heaven. It is terrorized. It cries. It falls down. It prays. It's veiled and it acts like a camel and races the moon. It even fears death. Tabati explains that the proof of the soundness of these statements comes directly from the messenger of Allah. Thank you.